Michael Joseph Savage Michael Joseph Savage, New Zealand's first Labour Prime Minister, was probably also its best loved. His avuncular image hung in the homes of the Labour faithful for decades. Savage was born into a poor family in Victoria, Australia. In 1907 he moved to Auckland, where Mick became Joe and the brewery Cellarman rose through the Labour movement. In 1919 he entered Parliament and three years later was Labour's deputy leader. Savage's and Labour's opportunity came in 1933 with the death of its leader, Harry Holland. Whereas the hardline Holland had scared middle-class voters, the gregarious but soft-spoken Savage personified Labour's diluted socialism or applied Christianity. As one historian said, Savage smelt of the church bazaar, not at all of the barricades. Labour won the 1935 election convincingly. Helped by a recovering economy, it unleashed a slew of popular reforms. Three years later it won again, backed by voter support for its plans for a comprehensive social welfare system. The apparently folksy Savage declared Premier House too grand for him, but ran cabinet tightly and cleared his desk each day. Labour refused to join Britain in recognizing Italy's annexation of Abyssinia, Ethiopia, and Savage disliked British pomp. But on September 3, 1939, both with gratitude for the past and with confidence in the future, he joined Britain in declaring war against Germany. Where she goes, we go, where she stands we stand. But Savage had already lost a more personal battle and was dying of cancer. Fifty thousand mourners filed past his casket and he was given a lavish public memorial in Auckland, Seddon and Massey are the only other PMs similarly honored. Michael Savage was born on March 23, 1872 at Tadong, near Benella in Victoria, Australia, the youngest of eight children of Irish immigrants Richard Savage and his wife, Johanna Hayes. Michael's mother died in 1878 when he was only five, and he was raised thereafter largely by his sister Rose. Brought up in the Roman Catholic religion, Savage for much of his life was a militant rationalist but returned to the Catholic Church a few years before his death. After attending for five years the tiny state school at Rothsey, where his father owned a small farm, Savage worked in a Benalla wine and spirits shop from 1886 to 1893. During that time he also attended night classes at Benalla College. He was spirited, knowledgeable and kindly, and fond of dancing and sport. A short but very strong man, Savage became well known as a boxer and weightlifter. He was secretary of the Ben Alla Fire Brigade and a member of its champion competition teams, and treasurer of the fundraising committee for the local hospital and asylum. In 1891 Savage was shattered by the deaths of his sister Rose, in childbirth, and his closest brother Joe, he adopted his brother's name, and from then on was known as Michael Joseph Savage. When, during the drastic depression, he lost his job in 1893, Savage walked to the Riverina district of New South Wales. There he found work for seven years as a labourer and irrigation ditch digger on the huge North Yanko station near Narandra. While at North Yanko, Savage became a member of the General Labourers' Union. He also became familiar with the radical political theories of the Americans Henry George and Edward Bellamy who were to remain an influence on him throughout his life. In 1900 Savage moved to North Prentice, near Rutherglen, Victoria, becoming a gold miner, stationary engine driver and foundation manager of a cooperative bakery. Influenced by the British socialist evangelist Tom Mann, Savage became active not only in the local miners' union but also in the political labor council of Victoria. Although chosen as the PLC's candidate in the state electorate of Wangaratta and Rutherglen in 1907, Savage was forced to withdraw when his party decided it could not fund his deposit and campaign costs. He continued to be active at both the local and state levels of the PLC and became a close friend of two other PLC members, Paddy Webb and Harry Scott Bennett, with whom he was later to be closely associated in New Zealand. The closure of the Rutherglen mines and the creation and breakaway of the Socialist Federation of Australasia from the PLC unsettled Savage, and in response to a suggestion from Webb, who was already in New Zealand, he emigrated, arriving in Wellington on the Manuka on Labor Day, October 9, 1907.
Although he had intended to join Webb at the Deniston coal mine on the west coast, Savage decided instead to move north. After working for six months cutting flax in the Manawata Swamp and visiting Wehi, he arrived in Auckland in 1908. There he found board with Alf and Elizabeth French and their children Aruba and Bob. Savage, who never married, was to live with them until his death. Within a short time he secured employment as a cellarman at the Captain Cook Brewery in Newmarket. He impressed workmates as quiet and studious, and spent much of his money on radical literature. Savage was soon involved in unionism as president of the Auckland Brewers, Wine and Spirit Merchants and Aerated Water Employees Union. In 1910, he was elected president of the Auckland Trades and Labor Council. Savage, who from 1908 had been secretary of the Auckland branch of the New Zealand Socialist Party, opposed the formation of the first New Zealand Labor Party in 1910 because it refused to include socialist objectives in its platform. He resigned as president of the Auckland Trades and Labor Council in 1911 and became instead Auckland branch chairman of a rival and more radical new trade union organization, the New Zealand Federation of Labor, commonly known as the Red Fed. Savage and other leading Auckland socialists such as Scott Bennett, Tom Barker, Tom Bloodworth and Peter Fraser organized educational, social and propaganda meetings almost every night of the week and also distributed the Red Fed newspaper, The Maori Land Worker. At the 1911 parliamentary elections, Savage stood as Socialist Party candidate for Auckland Central, coming second of four candidates and polling 1,800 votes to the 4,061 of the successful Liberal. The endorsements he received from moderate union leaders showed his ability to inspire confidence in others. In February 1912 he resigned as secretary of the Socialist Party's Auckland branch, intending to return to Australia, instead, he became caught up in the Auckland labourers' strike. Later in the year he was prominent in organising support for striking miners at Wehi. Savage was among the leaders of the July 1913 Unity Congress that attempted to bring together all the union and socialist factions in a new social democratic party, for which he became the Auckland organiser. Within a short time he was embroiled in the 1913 waterfront dispute, which escalated into a bitter general strike and the defeat of the unions. In 1914 Savage again stood unsuccessfully for Auckland Central, this time as an SDP candidate. Immediately after the 1914 election Savage commenced organizing the Auckland political labor movement, and in January 1915 an Auckland Labor Representation Committee was formed with Savage as its secretary. It ran nine candidates at the 1915 local body elections, only one of whom, Dr. Florence Keller, who topped the hospital board poll, was successful. During this time Savage became involved with the WEA and was particularly influenced by the monetary reform views of Irving Fisher, professor of political economy at Yale University. The writings of Fisher reinforced Savage's belief, derived from his earlier reading of Henry George, Edward Bellamy, and Karl Marx, that gross underconsumption, economic deprivation and social misery existed in the midst of plenty because the means of distribution and exchange were unsatisfactory. The state alone should have the right to issue money and regulate its value and to control credit through a government-directed banking system. Savage lent his voice to the anti-conscription cause during the First World War, arguing at public meetings that conscription of wealth should precede conscription of men. He also continued to advocate direct industrial bargaining, the formation of one big universal union, and public ownership and control of industry. He supported the formation of a United New Zealand Labour Party in July 1916, becoming its national vice president in 1918 and its first permanent national secretary in 1919. From 1920 Savage often chaired meetings of the Labour Caucus even when its leader, Harry Holland, was present. His deputy leadership was formalized after the 1922 election when he defeated Dan Sullivan 11-6 for the position. Although he had resigned as National Secretary and Auckland Labor Representation Committee Secretary in July 1920, Savage still assumed a heavy workload. From 1922 he set out to expand labor's support beyond unionists, traveling frequently to rural areas. 
In an attempt to strengthen the party's organization in Auckland and overcome factional infighting in the Auckland LRC, he became its representative on the national executive in 1926 and joined its own executive in 1927. In September 1926, he attended the Empire Parliamentary Association Conference in Australia and spent the next two months travelling there. Until Walter Nash entered Parliament in 1929, Savage and James McCombs were Labour's principal finance spokesmen. Savage became a major advocate for increased pensions and the establishment of a completely free health service, declaring that all people as a right of citizenship were entitled to a reasonable standard of living in the days when they are unable to look after themselves, whether it be because of old age or physical infirmity. He was also largely responsible for the Family Allowances Act 1926, which the reform government freely admitted it had modeled on three earlier bills moved by Savage. The onset of the economic depression of the late 1920s and early 1930s and the deprivation and suffering that many people, especially the unemployed and the elderly, experienced put tremendous pressures on members of parliament. Savage was distressed by the hardship he encountered, and in 1931 was admitted to Auckland Hospital with mysterious abdominal pains, they were to recur throughout the 1930s. From 1933 he traversed New Zealand repeatedly with an intensity and evangelical fervour previously unknown in New Zealand politics. In the months leading up to the 1935 election Savage came to personify the Labour Party's common-sense humanitarian approach. He spoke with sincerity, eloquence and power, convincing many voters that he and his colleagues not only understood their problems but could be trusted to solve them. Savage refused to indulge in recrimination and divisive politics but sought to unite as many people as possible behind a common dream of a better and fairer society. With the addition of two Ratana MPs elected in Maori seats, Labour came to power at the 1935 election with 55 of the 80 seats in Parliament. The incoming government immediately paid a Christmas bonus to the unemployed and charitable aid recipients and approved seven days annual holiday for relief workers. In 1936 there was a landslide of legislation, much of which, by increasing community purchasing power, stimulated the economy, thereby creating jobs and, in turn, further demand. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand was made a state-controlled central bank and union membership became compulsory. A program of state house construction was started, commercial broadcasting was nationalized, guaranteed prices were paid for dairy produce, and the political alliance between Labour and the Ratana movement was cemented by ending some discrimination against Maori and by giving increased attention to Maori employment, education, health and land settlement. In 1937 Savage sailed to Britain to attend the coronation of King George VI and the Imperial Conference. He had earlier questioned the need for Edward VIII's abdication. At the conference Savage distinguished himself from his fellow prime ministers by criticizing Britain for weakening the League of Nations, damaging the concept of collective security, and failing to adequately consult the dominions on matters of foreign policy and defense. He referred particularly to Britain's appeasement of Japan over its invasion of Manchuria, of Italy over the conquest of Abyssinia, Ethiopia and of Germany over that country's rearmament. He dismissed a British report on economics and foreign policy prepared for the conference as bunkum from end to end. The British, the Australians, the Canadians and the New Zealand National Party all criticised Savage's remarks. Savage was unimpressed, and at further meetings challenged Britain's commitment to the defence of Australia and New Zealand and the viability of Britain's Singapore base and Pacific fleet in the event of a Japanese attack in the Pacific. He also suggested that New Zealand might need to foster secondary industry or find a market other than Britain for its primary products. Subsequently, New Zealand was to distance itself from Britain at the League of Nations opposing Britain's further appeasement of Franco in Spain and its unwillingness to allow the League to take a firm stand against Japan's invasion of China. In 1938 Savage publicly criticized Britain's acceptance of Hitler's annexation of part of Czechoslovakia, this led to his being condemned by leading New Zealand newspapers such as the New Zealand Herald and Dominion for this embarrassing and deplorable display of empire disunity. 
In April 1938 Savage outlined the government's social security proposals. Responding to a suggestion from the Rev. W. H. A. Vickery, mayor of Kayapoy, he started to use the term applied Christianity to describe the government's scheme, now before Parliament. The Social Security Bill provided for a universal free health system covering general practitioners, public and mental hospitals, and maternity care, a means-tested old-age pension of 30 shillings a week for men and women at age 60, and a universal superannuation payment at age 65. A week after the Social Security Bill was introduced to Parliament on August 12, 1938, Savage collapsed in Auckland. The diagnosis was cancer of the colon necessitating immediate surgery. Any delay, Savage was informed, could be fatal. Although he realized his medical advisors were probably correct, Savage was reluctant to be incapacitated over the next two months during which the Social Security Bill had to be enacted and a critical election fought against a revitalized opposition. A change of leadership would be very destabilizing for labor. The threat of war in Europe was a further concern, as was the erosion of New Zealand's overseas reserve funds. Savage decided to delay the operation until after the election and in the view of one of his confidants, the Anglican Bishop of Wellington, thereby signed his own death warrant. The social security scheme was a team effort and other MPs and public servants had more to do with the detailed negotiations and drafting of the legislation than Savage. But Savage himself decided on the basic scheme, kept pushing his colleagues, helped resolve deep divisions of opinion within caucus over principles and detail, made many of the major public pronouncements and guarantees, and cut ruthlessly through the opposition from the Treasury, the New Zealand branch of the British Medical Association, and the National Party. It was also Savage who insisted that the Act contain a provision that it would not come into force until April 1, 1939, thereby giving National the opportunity to revoke it if they won the election. Savage thus set the agenda for the election, virtually guaranteeing a Labour victory. Savage's 1,938 speeches to crowds of up to 30,000 were among the most moving and inspiring ever made in a New Zealand election campaign. Labour's share of the votes rose from 46 to 56 percent. Immediately after the election, at the first Labour caucus on November 3, John A. Lee, who had increasingly opposed Savage since having been excluded from the first Labour cabinet, moved that caucus elect a new cabinet rather than endorse either the existing one or one nominated by Savage. After a bitter debate caucus narrowly passed Lee's motion. Savage refused to accept the decision until it had been endorsed by the party's national executive and annual conference. Lee, who realized that Savage was dying and that he also had to be in cabinet in order to have a hope of defeating Peter Fraser for the leadership, now started a vicious and sustained personal campaign against Savage. The Prime Minister was ailing but continued to play a decisive role in government. He intervened personally in negotiations over a free health system, issuing an ultimatum to the doctors and breaking their resistance, which a more cautious Peter Fraser, Minister of Health, had been unable to overcome. He took over as acting Minister of Finance when Nash went to England in May 1939 to raise overseas loans and was furious at the humiliating terms Nash was forced to accept. But the day after reading the budget on August 1, Savage collapsed and on August 4 had the operation he had postponed almost a year before. A week after he returned home from hospital, New Zealand, on September 3, declared war on Germany. Savage reluctantly spearheaded, particularly through broadcast fireside chats, an effective campaign to recruit volunteers for the armed forces. He refused to countenance a jingoistic or militaristic appeal and ruled out conscription in the early stages. He warned that if conscription of human flesh and blood did become necessary, then it would follow the conscription of wealth so that soldiers and their families were adequately cared for and their children not saddled with a burden of war debt. During Savage's illness, Lee increased the pressure not only on the Prime Minister but also on Fraser and Nash. Worried that Lee might be on the verge of organizing a majority in caucus, Savage determined to destroy the colleague whom he may have seen as a potential threat to New Zealand's democracy. Lee gave Savage his opportunity by publishing in the left-wing journal Tomorrow an article entitled Psychopathology in Politics, 
Although it did not name Savage directly, it implied unmistakably that Savage's physical condition had destroyed him mentally. Although Lee's supporters worked hard to build up support at the Labour Party conference which opened in Wellington on March 25, 1940, the majority of the delegates, led by Fraser and a phalanx of ruthless trade union leaders, were implacably opposed to Lee. The emotions of the majority were raised to fever pitch when Fraser read a surprise addendum to Savage's report to conference. In it Savage told the delegates that for about two years my life has been a living hell because Lee had disloyally and in defiance of earlier conference decisions attacked him through the public press with all the venom and lying innuendo of the political sewer. He claimed that Lee had attempted largely during my illness to destroy me as a political force. Lee was expelled from the Labour Party by 546 votes to 344, and a little more than 24 hours later, early on March 27, 1940, Savage died at his home in Wellington. It was four days after his 68th birthday. Undoubtedly the most loved of all New Zealand's prime ministers, Savage personified the social security system created by the government he led. His kindly and genial personality, and his skills as an orator, were largely responsible for ensuring the policy's acceptance. But Savage was more than just a great communicator. He was also the architect of the first Labour government's achievements just as he had been one of the chief organizers of its rise to power. He died at the height of his popularity, for decades afterwards, his photograph hung on the wall of thousands of New Zealand homes. He had helped set the social pattern of New Zealand for two generations, and had become its icon.